Please turn with me, dear saints, to James, the second chapter, James chapter 2. Our subject this morning is the title of favoritism or partiality. Favoritism. I do want to read the 13 verses for our focus today and probably next week and maybe the week after. Um, we're looking at uh, two weeks at least on this critical topic of partiality because we are by nature partial people. We're all inclined to treat others on a different scale. I mean, have you ever um, walked the path or crossed the path of someone who you admired or respected? Maybe a famous star, there are a lot of dimming and flickering stars in the Hollywood area, and we're close to it. Your favorite uh, actor or maybe your favorite athlete. And what happens to your heart? It probably starts, what, throbbing. There's a, a different response to that star or that athlete. And then here comes average brother Joe or average sister Jane coming by, and nothing moves you at all. Oh, there, is, there they are, and then the star shows up. I mean, it... The case in point, the same is true when it comes to popular preachers. There's a, there's a, a certain dynamic response when you run across a preacher who is famous that you've watched and you've observed. And you can't thank them enough for their ministry. And there are the tears flowing and there's a joy, and some of it may be genuine. Then here comes the average Joe preacher. Ah, uh, this is my Sunday morning pastor. Hey, pastor, how you doing? Oh, yes, great. Uh, nice sermon. But did you hear what this guy said last week? And all of a sudden, you, you perked up. We're partial people. Now, those are just small illustrations, but we're partial by nature. We, we have preferences. And so this text is applicable to all of us to consider and to think about this issue. In contrast to the character of God who is impartial in his judgment, impartial in his acts. He does not take a bribe. He is the same God toward all in his response. He doesn't act toward others because of their status or their position or their prestige or their legacy. He responds to them according to his upright character. James chapter 2, verse 1. My brothers, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into assembly with a gold ring and dressed in bright clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the bright clothes, and you say, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over there and sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, did God not choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and they themselves drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the good name by which you have been called? If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin, being convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery but murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak, 
and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of freedom. Verse 13, for judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Let me just uh, summarize the purpose of this epistle for us to consider as we move through this, this glorious letter. And it is to encourage Christ-like authenticity in every aspect of life, which includes what this text deals with in favoritism. There are some unfortunate abuses of this particular passage that we must always make sure as we work through it, it is clear that the text is not dealing with this issue at all. One of them has to do with the poor exegetical and explanation, the poor study of the original language, therefore leading to a poor explanation of this intent. And the intention is not to encourage the rich at all, uh, to, to level the financial field by unloading their financial resources to make sure that the poor is adequately taken care of and then we eliminate all the classes. Um, you recall our Savior used the analogy of talents. And the one man had ten, another had five, and then one had one talent. There was no sin in the talent. The sin was in the one person who had the one talent and did nothing with it. But the disproportionate degree of the talent was not a sin. The same is true when it comes to giftedness that we all have to humbly admit. Someone is most likely better at the thing that you're really good at. They're more talented, more gifted than you are. God is the one who imparts those gifts and then there are various degrees or measures of the gifts, the Scripture says. So therefore, there's no sin in the measure. The same is true when it comes to our social position in this world. The problem is not the social position, it is the attitude of the Christians toward each other. And then when the attitude is right, then we will care for each other without dealing with the the socialism or the communism in the background behind the equalizing of, of income. It is from love that we give, not a social agenda. It is from love that we share. We're compelled by the gospel to give, to share, but we're not compelled by some social agenda for an equal outcome. Because there will never be a truly equal outcome because we're not equally the same when it comes to giftedness and abilities. Uh, some people's ability will pr provide a certain level of resource for them because it is greater than others. And others will have lesser base on the ability, but the ability and the skill to do anything comes from God, so there's no sin there. The issue is the attitude that we have toward each other. Listen, dear saints, legislating financial equality does nothing for the heart, right? And God's desire is for the heart change, not for something external, but the internal work of the Spirit of God to produce true, genuine, God-glorifying change. This text is not dealing with tearing down of financial structures is concerned with the attitude of faith at work in the local church. Another unfortunate misuse of this uh, text of Scripture has to do with categorizing the poor of this world as the oppressed and the saved. So it is a social gospel, therefore, that says that if you are oppressed, uh, by a particular people group, then you're the ones that James talks about, so therefore there's something redemptive in it. 
So the original sin is not what was done in Genesis chapter 3. The original sin is, has to do with a certain racial or racialized categories. As opposed to seeing that the reality of the issue has to do with Christ at work in the heart. And so this movement hijacks a passage of Scripture and misappropriates it. So now the saved are the oppressed. The text says none of the sort because... When you look later in this passage, it speaks of God's choosing. You look early in chapter 1, when you see the rich and the poor person, you have a rich believer and a poor believer. So it is not a social category at all. It has to do with the attitude. It has to do with the attitude. What I want to frame this section is we just move past those misnomers that are, we would say, outside of Orthodox Christianity or not saturated in the gospel, there are secular social agendas that have crept, crept into the church, but it's not what the text is saying. Really, this is a fight. This is a battle. And the battle is pursuing sincerity in Christ, right? This, this sincere, singular devotion to God, as we've said before. As opposed to someone who says, I, I believe in Christ, I trust in Christ, but I do have preferences. And then there, there's some saints I'd rather be with and others I'd rather be without. Maybe even as in the Sunday gatherings, as you, you come together, you hold the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's some people you will talk to right in the fellowship, but there's some people you will just flat out avoid. So this favoritism is, and the use of the poor and the rich are extreme cases. It's an illustration, but it is exposing the issue of the heart. It, it doesn't have to be an issue based on financial means, but it could be something about the individual or just maybe a preference of your heart that puts you in this unfavorable position, this evil position of partiality. Now, on a grand scale... Persistent partiality is an evident sign of unbelief. Because James says, Do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. In other words, he says, You can't do both. And you can't keep doing both. Persistency in, in this duplicity is consistent with unbelief. It is not faith at work. And Part of the reason why is because of the character of God. If Christ dwells in you, that is incompatible with the nature and the character of Christ and who you're being conformed to. So our lesson, winning the battle against favoritism, is a demonstration of genuine faith. This fight against favoritism is a demonstration of genuine faith because... He mentions faith here in verse 1. He'll mention it also in verse 14. So this is a matter of true, genuine Christianity. This is like the real deal. And this is what a Christian cannot do and identify himself or herself as a follower of Christ. So number one, I'm going to give you the first command, and there's some other sub-points throughout this, but the first command in verses 1 through 4 is really verse 1. It is leave social structures. Leave social structures. That is so important to consider, dear saints, that our identity with Christ is not based on the world's structure. Our love for each other is, is not rooted in, in the world's system. So what the world decries, we do not. What the world upholds and supports, we may not. We do not base our love on social structures. It is to love all God's people as the opportunity is given without thinking lowly of the other party. Now, just as a, a quick example, some of you here may have brothers and sisters in Christ that you're closer to. You know, you're closer to some brethren in the church. You got a special little, you know, holy dap, a holy hug, a holy, you know, kind of one of those things. So you guys, really, you guys really hang out, you kick it well together. That's not what the text is saying. The text is not against that. Jesus himself 
uh, had three out of the, the 12, right? John, James and John and Peter. And he would take those three aside often. They were, they were witnesses of the Mount of Transfiguration. It doesn't mean that he, he was partial toward them. It was just a, a different uh, camaraderie between Christ and these three. He sovereignly chose them for some reason. So you can have close friendships. That's not what the text is saying at all. Uh, the, the, the idea of, of personal favoritism uh, is from the Hebrew word. It is to lift someone up above another. So therefore, to raise one person up, guess what you have to do? You have to put someone else down. So it's not that I have a close friendship with this person, and, but I have friendships with others. No, I have this close friendship with this person because of some mutual benefit. I'm, I'm on their, like, Facebook page. And I always approve what, I always check what they do, right? You always like what they say. It could be nonsense, but man, they're, they're special people. They might help me get somewhere. I'm going to like their tweets because, you know, I mean, see, that's, you know who that is? It is that, but you will not do that for everyone else. Someone else makes this off-the-wall comment, this crazy gesture, this just foolish statement. You'll be like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not liking that. But no, let that special so-and-so do it. It's like, I got to like them because I don't want them to know I don't like them. Click. That's partiality. You are raising one up at the same time someone else is being set down. And then to add to that, you're making a judgment based on external criteria. Whether it be material, financial, or relational advantage, it is something external that you're gauging them by and that you're honoring them through. This uh, partiality or personal favoritism is akin to what Leviticus notes. In this text, it is based on the character of God. For example, in Leviticus chapter 19, beginning with verse 15 of Leviticus 19, you shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial. Here it is. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor defer to the great, but you shall judge your neighbor in righteousness. You shall not go about as a slander among your people, and you shall not stand against the life of your neighbor. Why? I am Yahweh. You, are you seeing what's happening in verse 1 of James? That personal favoritism opposes the very nature and name of God. It's not some, some light event. You are bringing God's character into question. And something similar happened in chapter 1 of James, did it not? When you're commanded, let no one say when he's being tempted or being tempted by God. You're bringing God's character into question. So now you're not just judging the person as unworthy. You're judging God's choice of this person you deem is unworthy. So the issue is not just relational on a horizontal plane. It's an issue on a vertical plane. It's an issue of worship. It's an issue of faith. Therefore, it's an issue of the gospel. It's an issue of salvation. It was Peter in Acts chapter 10, verse 34, as he saw the work of God in the Gentile nations, he expresses this truth about the character of God. He says, I must truly comprehend now that God is not one to show partiality. So this, this social structure of partiality of pursuing friendships or going out of your way to show honor to someone to the detriment of another is to attack the very character of God or to bring it into question. It says, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ there are several possibilities for the meaning of this title, glorious. We know that God's glory was manifested 
uh, through a cloud in the Old Testament. For example, in Exodus chapter 40, verse 34, in Exodus 40, 34, you can note that God's glory filled the tabernacle. In 1 Kings 8, 11, His glory or His presence filled the temple. But now where is God's glory? God's glory is seen in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, glory is not only the manifested presence of God in the person of Christ, but glory is also synonymous with the character of God. The character of God. So now you have competing attributes. You have the the attribute of the fallen heart, to be partial, right? But then you have the attribute of God who is impartial. He's glorious, and the Lord, Savior Jesus Christ, is also glorious because he's God in the flesh. So now you have two competing views. We often use the term world of views. This is one of them. Are you in the world? Or are you in the truth? Do you trust in God? Or do you trust in the world? And, and, and so it, it collides here in this text because you can't do both. If glory is synonymous with his attributes or character, then the character of Christ stands in contrast to the sinful attitude of favoritism. There is, there is a battle going on between the two. And the battle is for your affection to pursue the impartial above the partial. If God is impartial by nature and we're not, we must depend on his grace to pursue this and leave those social structures alone. And I know it is prominent, especially the last few years, it has been prominent. And I'd be a fool to say if I wasn't aware of all the issues that has gone on in America in the past and in the present, uh, I would be a fool if I didn't uh, say that I am aware of the history of the church, of the so-called church and segregation. I'm aware of those things where we allowed the law of the land to usurp the authority of the law of God, and we became partial people. I'm aware of that. And trust me, I looked in the mirror this morning, and I know what I look like. So I say this as a preacher of the Word of God. That what happened with segregation has nothing to do with, listen to me, I'm just just saying this for the purpose of argument, has nothing to do with the white church or the white man. End quote. Because that's a, once again, that's a social structure, but I'm just using it for the sake of argument. It has to do with the heart because we are all impartial or partial people. We're not naturally impartial. We have favorites. So let's just reverse the process back then and put you in that position. You would not do anything different if God doesn't rescue you from that decision. So to see it as a, a social Structure is to miss the whole point of the argument from the Scripture. You will not do anything different. All right, for the sake of argument, I know this makes some people nervous, but I'm, like I said, I'm perfectly fine because this is the truth. It's God's Word. Put the black, quote, black man in the white person's position, and they will do the same thing because the Scripture makes it clear. We are partial by nature. It's, just, it's not the, the melanin of the color that makes us who we are. It's our heart. That's the issue. And when we build our argument and social structures, we never really get to the problem and we don't resolve it. So we have all these laws, all the legislation. We're passing this law, that law, fix this, fix that. I mean, there's so many laws, people are going dizzy. They'll pass one law and there's 6,000 pages for one law. I mean, who's reading this stuff? No one's reading it. Because the issue is not legislation. The issue is salvation. And for the Christian, the issue is sanctification. So if someone, if you were the big boot and the other person was the ant, because of partiality, you would love to stomp on them. And isn't that what we do when you see an ant outside? The ant's innocent. It's not going to come in your house, but because I have that power. Ant, meat, boot. I mean, that's, that's the, the human nature. That's the heart. It's, there's no advantage because you feel like you're under the structure. The issue is that the heart is corrupt. 
So we have to abandon these social structures because that is not where we stand in Christ. We've heard the phrase, right, at the cross we're all in this level place. We're level ground at the cross. Now, the world would like to, to have structures and say, well, you know, you have this and that person. No, we receive the same benefits and salvation. We're all sinners. We all need a Savior. We all have one in Christ. There's no other. And in Christ, we receive all the benefits. We're united in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the social structures, when we bring them into the church, now into our corporate worship, we don't see our brother and sister in Christ for who they are in Christ. That's where the heart palpitates when we see someone who's popular. Because, I mean, that's, say what everyone, that's partiality. It's just, even the heart's wired for that, right? It's, it starts to skip extra beats. The heart's wired for partiality. It's just the whole nerves. That's, that's the human heart. Um, if that were not the case, then you'll have the same reaction for everybody. Just excited to see the saints. Maybe you, maybe you didn't notice, but it was a little bit loud for someone else this morning. A little bit more of a... And the other person, have you ever done that? You see that person, but there were six people before that seventh person? One, two, three, four, five, six. You know them. But then there's that one person. It's as if they don't even exist. And then you go to me and say, oh, you know, hey. And the, you know, the girls are all hugging me. You know, I got the sister kind of talk going on. And it's all high-pitched and squealy and all teary-jerky. And I mean, the dudes don't do that. You know, we are a little bit more calm. And no, really, sometimes we're not. But, you know, all right. but then the first six... You're like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Hey, how you doing? Oh, and you're right back to it. I mean, I, I suffer from partiality, don't I? I do. It's, it's in the human heart. I mean, I'm blessed with a wonderful son and a daughter-in-law, but sometimes I even see them when my grandson shows up. Because <laughs> so, I'm, I'm partial. It's, it's like, he, I mean, it's, I can't hug him enough, but they should be hugged too, but yeah, but him. It's partial. It's in the heart. The text says that on a more serious level, that it's incompatible with the faith because it's not consistent with the character of God. It's incompatible with the faith because it is not consistent with the character of God. Now, we, we all, to some degree, have to wrestle with this some more than others, especially if you're in the world proper and, and you're, you're dealing with a lot of it. Some have echoed this, that you can hardly work without getting past the politics of the job. You know, you have, the, you have the alphabet soup trying to get their rights and trying to get you to agree with them. And you have people all around that circle forcing you to say the same thing. It's not, an, it's not an easy world to be in. So when you speak to them and they say, hey, have you heard of this issue? Have you heard what they're doing to us? Whoever us may be, you say, well, I know what the problem is, but it's not what you think. The problem is that whether it's them or you or me, we would not do anything different because of our heart. No, that's not what the world wants to hear, but if your thinking is not aligned with the Scripture, that's what James is talking about. Because you're bringing the character of God into question. You are double-minded with God. You would say yes to certain things about God and no to others. And you'll find that later in this text, right? Because James is going to illustrate clearly that if God is one, you know this, right? If God is one, then what is his law? His law is one. It may have several variations or expressions in it, but it's one law. It may have several commands, but it is one 
It's one unbroken chain because it's based on his character. Therefore, you break one of those laws, and guess what you are? You are a law what? Breaker. Now, we say this within the boundaries of the Christian faith, but if we don't capture that truth, then we, we will see ourselves as selective, quote, Christians. And I'm not as bad as this person. I don't do this. I don't do as bad as they do. I mean, come on, you know. I do the 99 and a half. I'm almost there. That is why I'm grateful for salvation. Because when you violate one command, you've broken all of God's law. Because it all comes as one package. It is not to lessen the severity of the sin. We should be broken of our sin. But it is to say that we cannot rest on our deeds. We must rest on the works of Christ for us. Because, let me just break it to you, dear saints. Day by day, you are probably a walking lawbreaker. I mean, it's like a walking opportunity just to break the law. When, when is the next time to break the law? When we, when we have the benediction. And you get in your old holy car. You turn on your holy ignition and you go completely unholy on the road. By nature. If you violate one, you violate it all. Now, the issue here, though, is, is not necessarily the violation, but the attitude toward the Word of God. Your attitude toward the character of God. And if you adopt social structures, you find yourself at a great disadvantage. Now, there are several charges in this section. So the first command is to leave social structures, but there are several indictments or, or charges against anyone who practices partiality. We should be practicing impartial acts of love and kindness. That should be the progressive work of God in the heart of the Christian. So you're not going to be impartial immediately. You will not. The day you'll be totally and completely impartial is when you go to heaven. But in the meantime, there should be a progressive departure from this favoritism to the detriment of another, uh, to being inclined lovingly to all of God's people, no matter who they are in life. But the first charge is that um, you are adopting unbiblical categories. Unbiblical categories. Because it says this in verse, verses 2 through 4, If a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dress in bright clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, And you pay, notice this, you pay special attention. Maybe it's a perfume to go with in the cologne, but you pay special attention to the one who's wearing the bride clothes, and you say, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over there, you sit down by my footstool. Notice what it says here. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves. So here you're looking favorably upon this person. You're looking upon them and you see them. You say, wow, this, this is impressive. And in your heart and also with your lips. So there's the believing that this person should receive and then the actual doing of it. You have made a distinction between two people to where in Christ there is no distinction. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. All are united, one, in the Lord Jesus Christ. What is interesting is that the word for distinction, although they're, they're, they're varied, the root word for distinction is the same in verse 6 of chapter 1, the word doubting, and in verse 8 of chapter 1, the double-minded person. So it, 
It pictures someone who vacillates between trust and doubt or faith and unbelief, obedience and disobedience. So instead of having this pattern of obedience, you have this back and forth, back and forth, just this pendulum of today I obey, tomorrow I don't. It's what is called selective Christianity. It's really popular in America. It sells. Selective Christianity is really popular in, um, in Texas, for example. There's a guy named Osteen who sells it really well, selective Christianity. Uh, Andy Stanley sells it very well, just heretical teachers. You need a list? I'll send them to you. There's more. The irony is that persistent double-mindedness and I say this with as much grace as I can, is a mark of unbelief. In other words, you are, you are not a Christian. Because you're using religion, therefore, to gain an advantage. It is, it is it's a, a weapon now. You're weaponizing Christianity for your personal gain. That's one of the issues with the Word of Faith movement. Among many, it uses the Word of God as a means for financial gain as opposed to what the Scripture says, that godliness, 1 Timothy chapter 6, with contentment is a means for great gain. There's a very similar hazard here in James chapter 2, where, where you're using certain principles of Christianity to leverage your relationships. And as you do so, you are just like the double-minded person because this is duplicitous. This is two personalities of I'm in Christ and I'm not in Christ when it comes to this type of activity. Now, the nuances between chapter 1 and, and this section are slightly different, but the impact is the same. There's duplicity in chapter 2 as there's in chapter 1. You claim to believe in Christ, but you treat each other according to class or rank. And Christ does not do that. Christ does not treat us according to our class or or rank. He receives us and he loves us affectionately. Now, what you find in chapter 2 and chapter 1 is that both parties are responding based on a heart that is divided and not committed to Christ. So with a divided heart, there's a lot of vacillation, a lot of doubting, a lot of skepticism toward God. You will have bouts with doubt, but the, bout, the, the battle here, the bout here is a consistent, ongoing, unbiblical view of God. You, you have a continual, pessimistic view of God. You have an ongoing pattern of doubt when it comes to God. That's the nuance you find in chapter 2. So both decisions in chapter 1, this, this person who's double-minded, and in chapter 2, it has to do with a decision from a heart that's divided. From a heart that's divided. So if, if you battle with favoritism and partiality, it's an indication of a divided allegiance to God and to self. Well, you know what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ said, right? He says that no... Man can serve two masters. Beloved, your sin, it's a master if you allow it to be. And in this case, it's ruling because now the example is you've made a decision. That's what he says in verse 4. Uh, this distinction is that you've made a judgment decision. You've considered the evidence and you know the truth from God's word, but you don't side with the truth. You side with what will be to your advantage, as opposed to what will honor Christ. But there's, as I said before, it is not that we won't do this from time to time as believers. It would be great if we did it a lot less. The church is strengthened when we, we don't have these issues, but we have them. We have our little circles or our little clicks, and they're generally unholy because it's hard for people to get in it. It's like, they just can't get in your little circle of friendship in the church. It's, 
It's part of the, the partiality of our heart. But this issue is not just a recognition of it, but the refusal to change. There's no interest to change because you don't have that advantage anymore with this respect of persons and this favoritism that you're exercising. But as you give into this, it becomes an unbiblical category. And as I said before, the persistent habitual activity according to what this explanation gives, means that there is probably an issue of the heart when it comes to salvation. Because to continually resist the word and the warning of God when it comes to these issues of the heart, the only ones who resist the word of God are those who have a stubborn heart, but what James implies is that in salvation, God gives us a heart of what? Flesh. To write his word in our hearts so that we may do it. Now, is it true that some sins die hard? Oh, boy, yes. But they must be dying nonetheless. If this sin is, is a full-fledged muscle builder and it looks like Hulk on steroids, then you need to kill that sin and starve it out. It looks nothing but skin and bones. And then starve until it's on a respirator. I'm from a respirator to an intubator, and then from there to death. Kill it, because it is unbiblical. But then in verse 4, here's the, the second charge in the indictment. It is that you judge with sinful motives. You judge with sinful motives. So now you have a heart that contradicts faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but now you are making a decision, and when it says become judges with evil thoughts, um, as a judge, the decision is not random. We've been to a, a court case, and the court is in recess while the judge decides. So he goes back into his room, and he, he looks at the evidence, he weighs it, and he, he hears uh, the arguments from of the prosecution, the arguments from the defense attorney, and he weighs it all, and maybe he listens to family members if the case is severe. He goes back into his chamber now, and it is not some random activity. He's really thinking about this decision. That's the implication here in this text, is that the judge with evil thought is like, oh, man, my bad. I, I, I know I missed you, and, man, I held other person like they were a rock star, and I, tried you like, you know, I treated you like you're a bunch of dead rocks. I'm sorry. No, it's, this is thoughtful, this is intentional, this is willful. But it says that this motivation is from an evil desire, an evil desire. And it is so severe here that it is given the same treatment as an unjust judge. So you're no different than the judge who deliberated the criminal should receive the death penalty. And because someone probably tipped the judge off or paid him off, said, hey, you know, if you have more bodies in prison, that's more money for you. If you kill them, that's less. So well, we have to lighten the load. And justice is not served. As you make that decision of partiality, there's an indication that you can be bought. Like the wicked judge who can be bought, you can be bought. So you judge with sinful motives, and it says evil thoughts here. Behind the implication of the thought is revealing the motive of the heart. And at the very depths of your heart, this is what you desire above Christ. And remember, this this is a battle against your faith in the glorious one. This, this is a battle for your affections for Christ. As a Christian, it's an ongoing battle. If you're an unbeliever, there's no fight here. You lose every time. You say, well, I am a professing believer, but 
I tend to lose this battle more often than not, then my first question to you is, what is your attitude toward the loss? Does it grieve you? Are you in pain over it? Is there sorrow? Is there sadness? Or when it happens, you're like, well, look at what it produced. I showed partiality to this person. I dishonored this other party, but man, I got free tickets. I got free vacations. Then your allegiance, it's not to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is to yourself. There's a difference once more, again, as I said before, in, in the attitude. We don't look at just the action, but the heart behind it. So we may, many of you here, some of you here, and you may wrestle with this because you've grown up with that type of persona of a favoritism, incurring favor from others because you know there's a payback, and then you bring it into the Christian faith, and, and now it affects your relationships. The question is, not that you're doing it or you're not doing it, it is, it is what is your attitude toward these actions when it comes to the nature of your Savior that you've come to know who's, who's impartial, who's merciful, who's good, who's kind, who's loving, who's forgiving, who's caring. And then that these are the attributes that we should express day by day in our lives and interaction with each other and even the world. It's, it's about the attitude. That's, that's one of the, the, the beginning and the starting points. It's not just the action, but the motivation behind it. And so when, when you're judging with sinful motives, it means that what's behind this action is a sinful desire for something that God forbids. Uh, there are three more charges. If you say, well, can you give me something better than this? The third charge, and, and then we'll hit the pause button, it is that you dishonor instead of honor. You dishonor instead of honor. That's, that's what happens when you don't leave those social structures, when you show partiality. You begin to dishonor, but the issue is, You've dishonored the poor man, but the poor man is someone who comes into the assembly. Now, the poor man, the reason why I said the case here in the illustration is extreme is because the poor man, the clothes is shabby, and if it's shabby, he probably what, doesn't smell like Irish Springs, one of those old soaps. Uh, like the, the 40-year-old started laughing when I said Irish Springs, a young be like, what is that? Is that some kind of language? No, this is just a really bad soap. <laughs> Didn't smell good. This, this poor person, the, the odor, the, the fragrance is a turnoff. So naturally, when someone comes to you and they don't, you know, they don't smell their best and it's been a few days since they've seen a shower, it's, it could be difficult. Unless your adrenaline is going, all your senses and your nose is just, just every, you're picking it all up. So that's a natural, repulsive kind of circumstance, is it not? So the poor man is someone who visibly has all the marks of someone you might not want to be around. But you've dishonored him instead of honoring him, which means ultimately who are you dishonoring? The Lord Jesus Christ. Our Savior said, when you've done these things to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me, Matthew chapter 25. When you don't do it to the least of these who are my brethren, he's talking about his, his flock, you have not done it unto me. So when we honor all with love and, and grace and kindness, he's honored to Christ. When we have our little pockets of dishonor, it is not ultimately directed toward the person, the sin, of dishonor is directed toward Christ himself. Of course, uh, James continues that says, Is it not the rich who oppress you and they themselves drag into court? Do they not blaspheme the good name by which you've been called? Which is a, just a, a very convicting statement that he makes here. Very convicting statement. Because this name should be honored, it should be revered, it should be respected, it should be given all of the, the, 
the, the approval and the approbation and, and, and the glory and the honor and the recognition and all of those things. And you are dishonoring Christ. The rich unbelievers are dishonoring Christ. What's the difference? See that? What's the difference, dear saints? If the rich unbeliever is dishonoring Christ, that very name that you say you're associated with, but you as a professing believer, you're dishonoring a believer who's united to Christ, what's the difference? There is no difference. And that is, I think, the sober reality of, of not considering our progressive sins, instead of progressive sanctification, we keep progressing in these sins. That friendship with the world is hostility toward God. That's what's happening. It is an alliance with the world that if you practice this habitually, you don't really look any different than the rich unbeliever because you are also dishonoring the name that you say is good. Now, verse 5 ties into my second point, which we'll continue next week. And that second point is to listen to your testimony. Listen to your testimony. What did God do to rescue you where did he rescue you from, and why? Well, the reason why is you don't deserve it, but he's good. When you consider God's grace and salvation, when you examine, as he says, listen, my beloved. I don't want to get into this too early, but you should be humble because James used the word did, not God choose. I mean, we should all be crumbling on that one. Because it's, it's, it's election. Not election time. Not voting. But God called you to himself. Apart from anything in you. Anything done by you. This... If that's the case, if we're meditating on that reality and we, we reflect, and testimonies are really helpful when they're used well. Remember years ago when I attended church, and some of you know the background wasn't always the best, and testimony time really showed it up. Uh, some people really weren't really testifying, but you know, one lady, she, she had uh, grandkids that she was watching because her daughter died, and she would stand up and she would always have a hymn. And, I mean, the hymns were actually good, but she didn't always use the hymn book the right way. So during her testimony time, in the middle of a song, her grandson is acting up. And pardon me, it's just a, um, this is just a story. It's a real story. I'm not approving of it. She will close the hymn and just give him one whop on his head with the hymn. So those are, those are some of the, the testimonies I witnessed, and so it didn't leave a, a lasting impression. But a, a solid testimony of what God has done to rescue us from our sins it puts us in this really humble position. It... it it lowers you because you look at Calvin and you realize that, my goodness, as I look around, I, I'm in this crowd of people. I don't even deserve to be here. On my first day at the seminary back in 2011, they asked me to stand up, and I, and I said, I'm standing among men that I don't deserve to be with. But I'm here by the grace and the mercy of God. It has a way of just leveling all the lofty thoughts because you realize that apart from his grace, nothing at all will be accomplished. Apart from his grace, you are destined for an eternity separated from the glorious presence of God and the very presence of his unmitigated wrath in hell. Have you forgotten? Then remember. Rehearse it. Write it down. Read it out. Declare it to others. Your testimony of God's saving 
a great sinner by his great grace. Then when you see, whether it be the rich, the middle class, the poor, that structure has lost all of its value when you know that we're all here only by the grace of God. Let us pray. With humbled hearts, we give thanks to you that we can win this battle because Christ dwells in us. Thank you for encouraging our hearts, strengthening our will and resolve to, to love your people as you love them, to care for each other so that the faith that we hold in our glorious Savior is a, a, a faith that is single, that is precise, focused, looking alone to Jesus Christ.